Welcome to the Houston Maritime Museum. Um, we are, hopefully we'll have some more people come in. We're just gonna get started because we have this fascinating topic and we're really excited to have Stephen Kinnaman here to talk with us tonight. Um, first of all, I, a lot of you I recognize you have all been here before. If anyone hasn't been here before, let me know and we'll tour you around and, and uh, have to give you a membership brochure so that in case you'd like to join and become a member here. Um, I'm going to send out a, a sign-in sheet, if you don't mind, just uh, put it on the page so that we know that you came tonight. That would be great. Um, we are going through a lot of changes at the museum, and uh, every time you come, we're moving things around, trying to just at least give you an, a glimpse of some of the really fantastic stuff we have and more of our uh, things that we, we we just want to show you as much as what we've got, everything we've got. We've got some wonderful things here. Um, the museum is, we are in the process of uh, getting ready to launch a capital campaign for our new museum. We're going to be doing all sorts of very exciting things, so we'll keep you posted. And I'd love to take a survey and make sure, ask you all, that we can move the lectures from Thursday nights to Tuesday nights. Uh, don't know if that's an issue for anybody, but we, Initially, when we did it, we had really positive response. So we just want to make sure that in case that's an issue, we, we know about it. So let us know. Um, I um, We're very excited to be able to talk, uh, to have uh, Mr. Kinnaman here tonight to talk about his new book. Um, we have, it's kind of an interesting thing. It's always nice to be able to hear why people are interested in maritime industry or why they are here and what why they, they uh, what their, where their interest began. In his case, it started when he was very, very young. He was very interested in the sea and ships and things to do with maritime. So not too many of us get to be interested in something when we're very young and have that just sort of transition to our profession and our passion. And um, that's one of the unique combinations about, um, about Stephen is that he's really been able to take his passion and knowledge of the maritime industry and use it professionally as a maritime architect um, a maritime engineer and naval architect, and also um, to be able to look at history and his perspective on history, and from his vantage point, which is not just a historian, but also with a really strong background in the maritime um, industry and naval history. So, we are very excited to welcome him tonight, and um, Stephen, if you'd like to come up and join us, that would be great. And thank you all for being here. Is this, uh, are you all hearing it? Is that the sound check working? Yeah. 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 Okay, good. Well, listen, I'm pleased to be here tonight to present my latest book, Captain Bullock, The Life of James Dunwoody Bullock, Naval Agent of the Confederacy. Before I start, let me ask you three questions. First, how many of you in the audience has ever heard of the Confederate Raider Alabama? Okay. How many of you have heard of her captain, Raphael Sims? Okay. How many of you have heard of James Dunwoody Bullock? Okay. Well, that's, that's, that's a change from the normal audience reaction, so we'll try to improve on that tonight. Bullock's central place in history has always rested on the Civil War era accomplishments as a secret agent of the Confederate States Navy in Europe. He is well known for having bought brought into being the Confederate States cruiser Alabama and her deadly sisters. Many are aware of his illustrious Georgia ancestors who were so firmly entwined with the earliest American colonial experience and that he was the proud uncle of the 26th President of the United States, Theodore Roosevelt. It has even been suggested that Bullock is the forgotten hero of the South who died in obscurity far from his native land. Tonight's presentation will outline Bullock's biography, but with a focus on the ships he was associated with. These ships include four groups. First, those connected with his family or hometown, those he served on in the U.S. or Confederate States navies, the U.S. flag mail steamers he so ably commanded in the antebellum period, and finally, those ships he bought or built for the Confederacy during the American Civil War. As we, so, as we shall see, these ship types covered quite a range from sailing ships to fast steamers and everything in between. Next. 
James Dinwiddie Bullock was born in Savannah, Georgia on the 25th of June, 1823. This slide shows a delightful perspective view of the city made some years later. He was the fourth generation of his family's original Scottish immigrant, also named James Bullock, who arrived in Carolina in 1729. Savannah was then, as now, Georgia's leading port, and Bullock's father was a successful factor and merchant who did considerable business in Savannah and its environs. In 1818, five years before James de Woody Bullock was born, his father and 20 other leading Savannah merchants invested in the truly visionary concept, that of transatlantic steam navigation. The result was the steamship Savannah, which is credited with being the first steamship to cross the Atlantic Ocean. And here's the naval architect and marine engineer in me, even if she only used her engines for 80 hours out of a 29 and a half day voyage. Nonetheless, she was the first steamship to cross the pond. Next. Fifteen years after Savannah's epic voyage, the city of Savannah was again witness to another first in American maritime history. Entrepreneur Gazaway Bug Lamar, that's him and that's his real name, placed in service John Randolph, shown by this model, which was America's first commercially successful iron steamboat. Of interest to our story is that her hull was built by John Laird and her machinery was manufactured by Fawcett, Preston and Company, both of Liverpool, England, and both companies Bullock would later use as a Confederate naval agent. Next. Bullock's father, James Stevens Bullock, went on to build the magnificent Bullock Hall, shown in this picture, in Roswell, Georgia, in the upland uh, part of the state of Georgia. This home still stands today and is well worth a visit if you are in the Atlanta area. The docents would love to show you around and give you a peek into the details of the Bullock family's daily life. Next. In 1839, at age 16, James Dinwiddie Bullock was given an appointment as an acting midshipman in the United States Navy. He started his career at the Charlestown Navy Yard shown in these pictures in back of Boston. He was assigned to the U.S. frigate United States, the <coughs> sister ship of the extant 44-gun frigate Constitution, which is still at this historic Navy Yard. Next. As a midshipman, Bullock served on two ships off the Brazil station, the last of which was the U.S. sloop of war Decatur, shown in this picture. She's in dry dock, actually, at the Charlestown Navy Yard here. Of all the United States Navy ships that Bullock served on, Decatur was his favorite. You can always tell this in how a sailor writes about his ships, and it was clear that he prized Decatur's crew's performance above all others. Of interest was that during most of the time Bullock served on Decatur, her captain was Commander David Farragut, who would later become the Navy's first admiral and gain fame for his order of damn the torpedoes full speed ahead. Next. Next, Bullock joined the 74-gun battleship, her model is shown in this photograph, for a year's duty on the Mediterranean station. Delaware was the flagship of a squadron commanded by Commodore Charles Morris. Does anyone here know how Charles Morris gained his fame? He was Constitution's first uh, lieutenant or executive officer during a classic engagement with HMS Guerriere. So you can see Bullock was hanging around with some pretty impressive fellows while serving as a midshipman in the U.S. Navy. After a four and a half year absence, Bullock finally returned home in the year 1844. Then came Naval School in Philadelphia, where he graduated second in his class. Bullock's class of 1845 was the last to be traditionally educated before the United States Naval Academy was established at Annapolis. So Bullock has a claim to be one of the last of the old shellbacks to be traditionally educated in the United States Navy. 
Next. <clears throat> Bullock was then assigned to the U.S. store ship Erie, which was ordered to join the Pacific Squadron in the months before the outbreak of the Mexican War. Erie was the first documented example of administrative rebuilding in the United States Navy and was so altered not once but twice. And I should explain to you what administrative rebuilding was. What would happen is the Navy would bring a ship in for repair and if it was hopelessly rotten and not worth repairing, they had two, two choices. They could, they could scrap it, but more often than not, they would repair it using their slush fund of already approved repair funding rather than request Congress's permission for a new ship and new funding. So it was a kind of an end play to build new ships with repair money. And this happened quite regularly. Uh, it's at the root of the controversy over the U.S. Uh, Constellation. It's now in, in Baltimore. She was originally built as a frigate. And in the 1850s, hey presto, she appeared again, this time as a sloop of war. The uh, frigate Macedonian was uh, converted like this. There's quite a list of ships that were administratively uh, rebuilt. Uh, we hope the Navy isn't doing that now with nuclear aircraft carriers. <laughs> Next. Bullock's war service, in the Mexican War that is, began with a dashing mission on the schooner Shark, which was still born when she was wrecked off the Columbia Bar in September of 1846. Here's what happened. He came out to the, uh, is this working? Not too well. He came out to the Pacific Squadron and joined Erie at uh, Mazatlan. He uh, came out on Erie, and the, the American Squadron was at Mazatlan. There he was given a de facto promotion as an acting master to the war schooner Shark. Shark was then ordered to refit in the Hawaiian Islands at Honolulu, which she did, so we know Bullock visited Hawaii. She then proceeded on a mission to show the flag in the contested Oregon Territory, which at that time was jointly administered by the U.S. and Great Britain. So she sailed up the Columbia River, she anchored off the Hudson's Bay trading post at Fort Vancouver, and her crew did some uh, reconnaissance. She showed the flag, reassured <coughs> settlers. And as, when she made ready to leave the Columbia, on crossing the bar, which is a notorious navigational hazard, she struck and was a total loss, but her crew was all saved, largely through efforts of Bullock, the acting master. The problem was, by the time Bullock returned to California, the war's major West Coast naval actions were over. He served out the remaining war years idle on a series of store ships in Monterey Bay, finally returning to the East Coast in 1849. Next. Bullock was next ordered to join the Coast Survey. Run by the Treasury Department, this organization was at the time the leading scientific establishment in America. There he served on the U.S. schooner the Latin, shown in this photograph and <coughs> sail plan. By the way, that's thought to be the earliest photograph of a revenue cutter in existence. The Latin's captain at the time was Lieutenant John N. Moffat, who Bullock, as a Confederate naval agent, would later entrust with his first cruiser, Florida. So you see some connections are starting to be made that will show themselves in the future. Next. Bullock married in November of 1851, and his wife's influence caused him to request more family-friendly duty on the East Coast mail steamer service. He was soon in command of Black Warrior, shown by this magnificent James Bard painting. But then Bullock's wife died, and perhaps due to his lingering grief over her passing, one month later, his ship was the focus of the Black Warrior incident, where she was seized by Spanish authorities during Havana port call for alleged customs violations. <clears throat> for Bullock, the quickly escalating confrontation, which was front news event, front page event, was an awkward crash course in international relations. Next. Meanwhile, Bullock's half-sister, Mitty, shown here, was courted by and married wealthy New Yorker, Thee Roosevelt. 
Their week-long wedding, which occurred in Bullock Hall, and these rooms pictured here, was said to have inspired Margaret Mead's classic novel of the antebellum South, Gone with the Wind. Five years later, Mitty Bullock Roosevelt gave birth to a boy named Theodore, hence the Roosevelt connection. Next. Bullock continued on the East Coast mail steamers, next commanding Cahaba, shown here. In late 1854, he finally resigned from the Navy with rank of lieutenant, and a few years later, he remarried. Cahaba was a large wooden hull steamer, 250 feet long, 37 feet in breadth, and featured side wheels powered from a walking beam, you can see it up at the top, driven by an 11 foot stroke single cylinder steam engine, the latest in technology. Now, you might, these ships might look quaint, they might look old fashioned, they might look frail, but the records belie this. These ships were able to keep up a, a monthly service to the day, departing New York for Havana and New Orleans for year after year, season after season, almost without fail. It's almost like a liner service for modern jetliners. They are actually they're more rugged than you would have uh, cause to believe by looking at this nice old photograph. <coughs> Bullock was a well-praised, successful mail steamer captain. Evidence of his popularity lies in this silver ewer shown here, which is now in <coughs> Liverpool's City Hall, a, ge a gift of Bullock's eldest daughter. The inscription reads, presented to Captain J.D. Bullock of the steamship Cahaba for his kind attention to his passengers during their passage, April 27, 1859. Bullock made 37 outbound clearances from New York City on this one ship alone, and of all his commands over a period of a decade are considered, he cleared out of New York City some 70 times, something of a record for a captain in the years before the war. Next. Bullock's last antebellum mail steamer commands were a pair of fast side wheelers, DeSoto and Bienville, built for the New York and New Orleans Steamship Company. Bullock superintended their construction and took each out on her maiden voyage. For Bullock, this golden period was the lull before the storm. Both steamers were later taken into the US Navy at the outbreak of the war, and you can see here Three years after the war was over, DeSoto was still working for the Navy, which shows she must have been a good, well-built, reliable steamer. Next. Between South Carolina's secession and the firing on Fort Sumter, Bullock carried on as a captain, now of the steamer Bienville. He formally went south in New Orleans upon hearing that hostilities had commenced through a letter he wrote to Confederate Attorney General Judah Benjamin. Bullock then returned to Yenville to New York City to her owners. <coughs> Soon he was summoned to report to Confederate Navy Secretary Stephen Mallory in Montgomery, Alabama. For Bullock, it was a life-changing moment. His family was now entirely in the North. They had sold Bullock Hall, and his career was firmly tied to New York City-based mail steamers. But his deep Georgia roots beckoned, and he, like many other Southerners, answered the call. Next. On the 8th of May, 1861, Bullock, shown on the left, it's the only photograph we know of him in a Confederate Navy uniform, met with Secretary Mallory here in Montgomery, Alabama, and was assigned as a civilian agent to a cruiser purchasing mission in Europe. He left for England the very next day. Now, one noted writer of Southern naval history compared Bullock uh, to a maxim of Napoleon's. It went like this, I may lose a battle, but I never lose a minute. And I can tell you, having studied Bullock's day-by-day -day activities, this was true of this guy. He was a certain man who would have done his homework on Friday night to have it out of the way Sunday. Next. <clears throat> Bullock's first stop in England was Fraser Trenholm and Company, shown here at their number 10 Rumford Place 
uh, location in downtown Liverpool. This building is just blocks from the River Mersey. Just down the street here is the uh, uh, Western Approaches Museum where uh, Sir Max Horton directed the Battle of the Atlantic. <clears throat> it's a wonderful museum to visit. This bill is uh, uh, Fraser Trenholm Company was a bank, uh, very important one for the Confederacy. It was of enormous importance to their purchasing operations. They couldn't have survived without it. Bullock officed here in this building during the entire Civil War. It later became known as the unofficial headquarters of the Confederate States Navy in Europe. And soon after arriving, Bullock ordered the cruisers Aretto, later named Florida, at Miller Shipyard, and number 290, later named Alabama, at Laird's. Now, harken back to the little humble John Randolph, uh, the first cruiser, Aretto slash Florida, had a machinery built by Fawcett and Preston, who built John Randolph's machinery. <coughs> And the second cruiser, number 290, Alabama, was built by John Laird's, who built Alabama. So perhaps that little boy of 11 saw and remembered the builder's nameplates in the hull of that first successful iron steamboat. Next. <clears throat> Meanwhile, Bullock and the other Confederate agents continued to buy arms, ammunition, and clothing and loaded them onto the purchase steamer Fingal. This is a Union <coughs> spy sketch to alert the authorities of what she looked like. Bullock took command of the ship and boldly ran her into Savannah. The date was November 1861. It was the largest cargo of purely naval and military supplies that was ever brought into the South during the war. The son of Savannah returned home with a feather in his cap. Next. Bullock soon returned to England in his naval agent duties, but Fingal was trapped by the Union blockade. So the Confederates converted her into an ironclad ram named CSS Atlanta. That's her shown up here, if my little pointer works. This exquisite section view shows the ship modeling craft at its very best. And you can see here is the iron hull of Fingal converted by the Confederates with timber balks and improvised armor into an ironclad ram. And you get a great good idea of how cramped the conditions were inside of this Confederate ironclad. Next. Pictured here, and it's still standing today, is Bullock's first English home. It's in Waterloo, Lancashire. Besides providing a healthy family environment, it also had a splendid view of Liverpool Bay. Here is the geography. We're on the west coast of England. Here is uh, North Wales and the Irish Sea. The River Mersey is right here. On the right bank is the city of Liverpool, and closer to the mouth of the Mersey was the little village of Waterloo, quite fashionable at the time. Waterloo was connected then, as now, by rail to Liverpool. So we have the image of naval agent James Bullock commuting to work by train, which he did. If you were to stand on this front gate and gaze away from the house, you'd be looking out over the expanse of the Crosby Sands and Liverpool Bay. The view today is somewhat obstructed by a green windmill farm out there. So uh, the, the uh, greenies have won. But this house is, uh, Bullock lived in six different locations in uh, Liverpool and all but one of his former homes is still standing today. Next. This is Bullock's first cruiser, Aretto, later named Florida, pictured in the Bahamas where she experienced the ordeal of seizure and a vice admiralty court trial. This is the one with the machinery built by Fawcett and Preston and Company. Lieutenant John Moffat, shown on the inset, eventually commissioned her on the 17th of August, 1862. She was the first European-built Southern cruiser to enter service. And remember the connection with Moffat? He was the captain of Galatin that Bullock served on with the Coast Survey. Next. Here we have the famous number 290, later to be known as the CSS Alabama. 
Bullock thought he would command her until weeks before her sailing, but instead, Raphael Semmes, shown in the inset, was ordered to be her captain. This was perhaps Bullock's greatest disappointment of the war, but he rose to the occasion. In terms of raw adventure, Alabama's escape from England perhaps was Bullock's finest moment. Alabama was the most successful raider of all times. The Southern cruiser's prizes, some 250 in all, together with their continuing threat and its effect on marine insurance, doomed the American merchant marine. In time, this loss would surface as the United States' Alabama claims against Great Britain. Next. Pictured here are two of Bullock's most persistent foes in the United Kingdom. On the left, Lord John Russell, the British Foreign Secretary, and on the right, the American Minister to the Court of St. James, Charles Francis Adams. The British Neutrality Laws and Foreign Enlistment Act proved inadequate to stop the Confederates. With help from his lawyer, Bullock found the loopholes. But then the British government changed its policy to first seizing Confederate ships and then worrying about the courts. Next. British-U.S. relations came to a crisis over Bullock's most ambitious warship project, the Laird Rams, pictured here. In the drama caused by their imminent delivery, Minister Adams famously threatened Russell, it would be superfluous in me to point out to your lordship that this is war. The Rams were seized by the British and later taken into the Royal Navy. You can see this one is flying the White Ensign. They were precursors of the modern battleship. Let me explain why. They had a iron hull, a structurally built of iron. They were armored in the traditional fashion with a belt along their waterline areas and exposed to the armament turrets. They featured a turret forward and a turret aft. It's hard to see with the bulwarks folded up. Each turret carried a pair of twin large caliber rifled guns so their main armament layout was reminiscent of pre-dreadnought arrangements. They feature strikingly modern tripod masts. They even have a, telescope, a telescoping funnel to allow the funnel to be lowered to do two things, to change her appearance and reduce windage. But the real genius in these ships was in their size. They were small enough to enter Confederate ports the largest ports, that is, which means their draft was under 15 feet. But they are large and strong enough to cross the Atlantic on their own. And believe me, they were a threat to the United States Navy, and I'll show you why. Next. Shown here is the USS Lehigh, a Passaic-class monitor, the mainstay of the Federal Navy, and above it, is a plan of the original Monitor, so you can see her arrangements. Monitors were superbly configured for river and estuary warfare, but they were hopeless on the high seas. Given the scenario of a battle off of Charleston, which of these two ships would you rather be on? <laughs> Next. Bullock also placed orders in Liverpool shipyards for fast blockade runners. One of them was the famous Colonel Lamb, which survived the war untaken. She was one of the earliest steel-hulled vessels. Now, she may have survived the war untaken, but she didn't last much longer. The year after the war was over, while loading munitions for transit to Brazil, she unexpectedly exploded in the River Mersey and was a total loss. Next. <coughs> By late 1864, both Florida and Alabama were lost to the Confederates. Bullock deftly replaced them with the cruiser Shenandoah, shown here. Built by British owners to carry troops to India and return with tea, she featured a composite hull and a lifting screw, making her an ideal candidate for a Confederate States cruiser. The composite hull was a hull built with structural iron uh, main beams and ribs and keel, but planked with wood. And the lifting screw, you can see it here, 
was a uh, arrangement where the propeller, two-bladed only, of course, could be lifted clear of the water to allow the ship to sail unhindered as a sailing vessel. It made a noticeable difference in performance and two, to service the propeller if there's any issues with bearings for remote service. This vessel, under the command of James Waddell, shown on the inset, succeeded in destroying the American Arctic whaling fleet, most of which were burned in the days and months after Appomattox. After the seizure of the Laird Rams, Bullock turned his attention to France. There he hoped for more favorable treatment under Emperor Louis Napoleon III. Good luck, Bullock. <laughs> his focus was the shipyard of Monsieur Lucien Armand, shown here at the inset of Bordeaux, a noted <coughs> naval architect experienced in the building of ironclad warships for the French Navy. First ordered by Bullock were four clipper corvettes, one of them shown here, built to an improved Alabama design. By composite construction, and now you know what that means, they were 245 feet long, and they carried 12 30-pounder rifled guns of French manufacture, and incorporated a three-quarter inch armor belt in their midship areas. And fortunately for the South, and perhaps fortunately for the North, these ships never entered Confederate service. Next. The CSS Stonewall, shown here, was the only European-built ironclad to be delivered to the South. But she arrived too late after hostilities had ended, as Captain Thomas Page, who commanded her during her voyage across the Atlantic. A mean little brute of a warship, she was specifically designed for river operations to retake New Orleans. At the end of the Civil War, she was sold by American authorities to Japan. And let me explain her features. While you can't see it, she had twin screws and twin rudders to give her exceptional maneuverability, steaming in the Mississippi River. She was a composite hull and armored. She was ironclad, and she was equipped with, very obviously, an enormous piercer or ram in the bow. Her forecastle casement was heavily armed and equipped with a massive 150-pounder Armstrong rifle and a pivot carriage that could shoot straight out the bow port or side ports. And she was equipped after the mainmast with a turret with a pair of large rifle guns. So the idea was she'd steam and maneuver up the river, she'd ram or blast whatever was directly in front of her and give it a resounding broadside on the way past. Next. This list presents uh, a tally of ships bought or built by Bullock for the Confederate States Navy, excerpted from letter he wrote to Jefferson Davis in May of 1881. The two conducted a rather voluminous correspondence after the war, and Bullock wrote this at the request of Davis when he was compiling his own work on the Confederate government. And on this list, we see a lot of familiar names by now. We see Fingal, his blockade runner, Alabama, the famous cruiser, Agrippina, Alabama's tender, Florida, his first cruiser, Coquette, an iron screw steamer for blockade running, Shenandoah, the last cruiser, Laurel, Shenandoah's tender, Stonewall, that little brute of an ironclad we discussed, and Ajax was an iron screw, twin screw steamer they built for the Wilmington Harbor defenses but never quite made it into Confederate hands. Bullock writes, in addition to the foregoing, I built eight paddle steamers, especially for blockade running, and two large screw steamers for the same purpose. One of these paddle steamers we've seen is Colonel Lamb. In Bullock's modest style, this list here does not include all the ships not received by the Confederates. So to add to this list, we need to mention the two layered rams, the four clipper corvettes, an Armon ironclad sister of Stonewall that was never delivered to the South, several cruisers still building in England, and most amazingly, six uh, iron hulled knockdown down torpedo boats that Bullock had ready to ship in the first month of January 1865, but there was no Confederate ports to receive them. 
Bullock's navy and all his ships had been delivered would have been the envy of most nations. <clears throat> Next. The Civil War was now over and the Bullock brothers were stranded in England. They are pictured here in a photograph taken in the late 1860s. James here on the left, and these are, he's not in uniform, someone actually painted these stripes on a civilian jacket to try to make him look like a commander. <laughs> Bullock was in his early 40s and he had five children to support. He became a commission merchant. Brother Urban, his half-brother, who's ably served as a master and midshipman on the Confederate cruisers Alabama and Shenandoah, became a cotton broker. And starting a new life in England, it's interesting to note that the Bullock brothers returned to their family traditions, choosing careers that mirrored their fathers. Next. Post-war, Bullock traveled to the U.S. on five documented occasions. His last trip, accompanying his shattered nephew, Elliot Roosevelt, was made in February of 1892. At the time, Bullock was 65. This photograph is uh, uh, one we believe of him taken in at the age of 65, three years later. Bullock sailed on the crack White Star liner Teutonic, shown here. Teutonic was the largest ship of her day and had won the blue ribbon for crossing the Atlantic in other, under seven days. But more interesting to our story, she was also the first liner to be built under the British Admiralty's Auxiliary Armed Cruiser Scheme, and so was a modern heir to bullet Civil War era commerce raiders. I would have loved to have been able to have a walk with the old Captain Bullock on the deck of this ship and heard his reminisces about how things had progressed since his days building wooden <coughs> commerce raiders. Next. Bullock lived into the first days of the 20th century, dying on the 7th of January, 1901, at age 77. He was buried in a Liverpool cemetery far from his Georgia roots. In summary, what can I say about Bullock? You've seen the navy he created, but he did more than build a navy. He organized, he helped organize Confederate States Navy finances in Europe. He was uh, instrumental in purchasing and shipping prodigious quantities of war material, and he was also the Navy's chief legal officer in Europe. Looking at his life and putting it in perspective with his triumphs and tragedies, we can now recognize Bullock not only as an unsung hero of the American Civil War, but also a shining example of the American experience. Now you know the story behind the ships of Captain Bullock. Thank you for your kind attention. Yes. How, how was the financing provided for so many ships at that time? That's a question a lot of people ask. It was, uh, it was difficult. Uh, some of it was uh, the species brought out early in the war. Uh, some of it was from cotton run through the blockade by blockade runners Bullock proposed and got into service. Um, there was, some of it was raised by a loan in France called the Erlanger loan, it was a cotton bond. But if you look at Bullock's record, he was constantly, constantly overdrawn. He, he would have contracts out to the order of half a million pounds, and when he, he would have half of that available to pay them off. He was always um, strapped for money, and this is a whole story of its own about how the Confederates managed to finance what they did for so long. Uh, it really is a, it's a story that really should be given a talk of its own. Yes? Uh, when the Civil War started, did Bullock, did he debate long and hard about throwing his log in with the North or the South, or was it just already automatic? I'm from the South, so I'm on. Yeah, I, I, can, I can tell you from having studied what he did, uh, he didn't study long and hard about it. He knew what he was going to do. He was a man of his convictions. The, the astonishing thing is that what a life-altering decision it was, because he could have easily have just hung it up, retired, or captained steamers, but he, he took that steamer Bienville back to New York, he was honorable, turned her into her owners, 
and her next charter was to carry a Rhode Island regiment down to reinforce the from the riots in Baltimore that happened early in the war, and he refused to command her. And it was known right off that Bullock was a potential uh, def uh, southerner, that, and he knew he was being watched, and he had to act very carefully to do what he did. Um, you know, the, the official story that Bullock writes in his memoirs, if you read what Bullock tells you, remember he was in the Secret Service, he was a very private man. He makes out like when he got summoned to Montgomery and he met with Mallory, he, had, he thought he was going to be asked to, to uh, head up the defense of New Orleans. He knew this port like the back of his hand, sailing in and out of it. And he makes it in his memoirs like he was surprised that he was asked to go on this cruiser mission, uh, purchasing mission in Europe. But it turns out there is evidence that three days before he met Mallory and made out like he was surprised to be asked to do that, he made reservations for travel to England. <laughs> the, there's a record in the a Union spy wrote a message to Washington three days before that meeting saying, watch out for Bullock, he's headed to England. My guess is this, is that he did this, when he wrote his memoirs, it was in the 1880s. And guess what? Who was politically prominent in the 1880s that was a nephew of Bullock? Theodore Roosevelt. I think Bullock wrote his memoirs and kind of hid his, the degree of prior collaboration with secessionists to shield his nephew uh, politically from his own action. He was, a, he was a black sheep in New York City. He, he destroyed merchant ships. And so I think he hid his, uh, this is my conjecture, that he hid his prior secessionist dealings to protect T.R.'s reputation. Was, yeah. was there any relationship between Teddy Roosevelt and him, or? Oh, yeah, yeah he didn't hear that. He says that yeah. Theodore was his uh, well, I, know, I know that, but I mean, uh, as kin, did they? Oh, yeah, they visited, uh, after the war, uh, the Roosevelts came to England a number of times. Young T.D. was a little whippersnapper. He was always in awe of his, uh, his uncles, uh, James and uh, Uncle Jimmy and uh, Urban. And they had this, you remember, uh, T.R.'s dad bought a, alt a second to stand for him during the Civil War. Uh, he Roosevelt didn't fight during the war. He did some very good work for the Union Army but he uh, helping to collect savings for enlisted men. But he, he didn't have any part of the action. And young Theodore, a man of action, always, he loved his father. The one thing he didn't like was his father didn't fight. And his uncles, James and Irvine, fought. And they fought long and they fought hard. And Uncle Jimmy ran this blockade runner into, into Savannah and got the Confederate cruisers to sea. And Uncle Irvin fired the last shot on Alabama and her engagement with Kearsarge. So he thrived on these tales. And as you probably noticed, I cover this more in my other biographic presentation, T.R. wrote the, uh, a, a very well-known history of the War of 1812, the Naval War of 1812. And Bullock and T.R. visited in Liverpool in 1881 when T.R. was stuck Remember, T.R. never served at sea and didn't know how frigates fought under sail, but Uncle Jimmy did. So Uncle Jimmy explained to T.R. how you would uh, wear a frigate and what the weather gauge was. And in turn, uh, T.R. urged Bullock to write his memoirs, the only man who could write these memoirs. And Bullock had trunks full of papers. He saved all his papers. In fact, the, uh, you know what the official records of the uh, navies in the War of the Rebellion? ORN, the official records of the Army, this 20-volume set with all the letters, orders. Bullock donated all his copies of these letters to the United States government in the late 1890s, and they are what makes ORN the robust source it is. There's records of him handing them over to a U.S. Navy agent, and he got them back several months later. So the two were very close. Uh, they were... Uh, they were soulmates. They really were in a very strong relation. They saw each other quite frequently. And it was really a very endearing, it's one of these endearing stories that makes this such a compelling tale, James Dunwoody Bullock. I have a question. All those ships that he was buying, and what did a ship cost at that time? What are the average, I mean, any one of those? The, to outfit, to build it, 
Uh, a good example is Alabama. She cost four, 47,500 pounds sterling, which is about uh, 250, $240,000 back then. Which is now, wow. Well, now it would be a lot more, but the, uh, the thing is that uh, if you took her, think about the, the efficiency of what, what these guys, the Confederates, did. It cost them a quarter of a million to build the ship, add another $200,000 for her cruising fund, uh, over two years, she sailed for two years, so you got $400,000 roughly. She destroyed five and a half million dollars worth of American merchant ships. So this is a multiplier of 10. It's a very effective use of money if you're looking to destroy your enemy. And they did this not with one cruiser, but with several. Remember that Alabama packed 65, and the total from all these different cruisers is about 250. And it was this flight from the flag, the fear of a U.S. flag that really ruined the American Merchant Marine. It never recovered since then. Yeah. Are there descendants? Yes. Great story. Bullock, um, Bullock was from a large family. He had multiple in-laws and step-siblings. His father married his stepmother-in-law. Think about that. <laughs> How do you do that? But he did. Bullock had five children. He had three sons and two daughters. His oldest son, James Jr., his apple of his eye, tragically died at age 30 of typhus while visiting the United States. His second son died of scarlet fever at age 10. His two daughters, one of whom married, remained childless. His oldest daughter, uh, Martha, died in 1947, three years before I was born. So think about it. Bullock's oldest daughter died three years before I was born. His youngest son, Stuart Elliot Bullock, is the one that carries the lineage. He emigrated to Australia in the, in the late 1900s, about 1890. We're not sure why, but he was a very handsome young man, very dapper. He looked 10 years younger than he was. And the rumor is is he probably got some young lady in trouble, and back then he left town when that happened. <laughs> so he immigrated to Australia, started up a new life there, and when the First World War broke out, Stuart Elliot Bullock volunteered for service in the Australian Army, and he had the misfortune to serve in Gallipoli. Oh. At the end of that war, he returned home, bedraggled, but with some medals. He returned to Australia, by home, uh, I mean that, and he married, and he had his one and only child, which would have been Bullock's only grandchild. And this grandchild was born 19 years after Bullock died. This grandchild, who dropped the surname Bullock, became known as Jim Elliott, uh, died in 2011 at age 90 in Australia. So Bullock's only grandson died three years ago, <coughs> to put it in perspective. And this grandson, you talk about the misfortune of, of Stuart Elliott going to the Gallipoli. This grandson, who had been born in the 20s, joined up the Australian Army in World War II. And instead of going to Europe to fight Hitler, he had the misfortune to get sent to, guess where? Singapore. And he, he got swept up in the British Army's greatest defeat <coughs> ever. Yeah. He served on the Death Railway and the, you know, the Bridge on the River Kwai, prison ships and a copper mine in Japan, finally returning home after three and a half years of hardship to Australia, where he fathered three children. And I'm proud to say one of these children, Jim Elliott, who is now retired as a professor at Curtin University, I've been in touch with him, Bullock's great-grandchild. He read my book and I must admit he really liked it. If you go to the Amazon website, uh, you'll see a review of him. He identifies himself by name as Bullock's great-grandson. And so the Bullock line, the male line, if you follow it strictly now, is, resides in Australia. Interesting. This is a family that just gives value for family uh, excitement and, and the lineage. I always wonder in the Georgia family how they introduced each other at these family meetings. When they had they had step siblings, half brothers. <laughs> you know, when you marry your stepmother in law, strange things happen. <laughs> Anything else?
Yes. I thought it was interesting that we had a uh, formal course of naval instruction before the founding of the Naval Academy in 19, 1845. I was wondering if anybody had written any books or about the history of, of that, uh, evidently at least a school, and maybe more in the Philadelphia area or be, uh, up to that time? I've never seen a, a history of naval schools prior to um, Annapolis, but it was a very ad hoc system and it was widely regarded as being very uh, inefficient. What they would do, remember the military, Naval Academy, the Military Academy at West Point was founded in what, uh, 1802? And the Navy was very slow to react. They had this traditional mentality that the only way to train officers was on the ship. So what they would do is they would appoint uh, schoolmasters and chaplains to the larger, like the ships of the line, to educate the middies. But if you read the report, I, I quote it in my book of uh, Secretary of War Bancroft. Uh, this system was really rotten. Some of the masters were incompetent and didn't do anything. The, you imagine trying to educate, do classroom education of a, a midshipman on a ship when they're doing a watch standing. And the last thing they have to do is read treatises on navigation. It was really a, a, a failed system. The one thing it did do, and Bullock writes about this, it produced a class of officers that was accustomed to the hardship of the sea at an early age. Bullock's feeling was these officers who went to the Naval Academy, by the time they really got out and served on ships, these guys were, what, 21, 22 years old? And by then, they'd lost the custom of uh, standing up all night on a freezing deck uh, on a sailing ship. And this was not easy duty. So. It's a long answer to your question, but it was a very imperfect system, and there were naval schools sometimes in New York and in Norfolk, I think, and more lately, uh, before Annapolis, they centered it in Philadelphia. It was a, uh, a naval asylum there. It's a beautiful, uh, uh, it's been, the, the building is preserved today, in fact. It's a uh, Georgian, a uh, Greek revival style building that's been converted, I think, into condos. It's actually quite a famous, it looked like Bullock Hall on a larger scale. Uh, rambling answer to a specific question. Okay, well listen, thank you so much for your attention. <laughs> oh, just a second. I, I should announce to you that, well, I'm off the air here. Oh, there we are. Uh, up, up in the front, if any of you are interested in buying books, we have them for sale. There's the uh, Captain Bullock book, that's $35, it's a hardback. I also have a uh, earlier book titled uh, The Most Perfect Cruiser, it's a paperback, $15. It's the specific story about how Bullock built Alabama and got her to sea. It's kind of more focused on Alabama. So This young, uh, lovely young lady will be glad to take your cash and checks. <laughs>